welcome everybody. Uh, this is Joe Hoover, and uh, you are attending uh, the session on risk management, digitizing safety on copyright. And I will be presenting for the next bit here. Thank you for coming. Um, we'll get the show on the road. So the first thing I want to talk about is much of this is uh, what you're seeing here is first you can download this. I'll bring that up is that if, uh, the whole presentation is available uh, at the URL at the screen there. Um, but much of this has been excerpted from uh, Copyright and Cultural Institution Guidelines for Digitization for Libraries, Archives, and Museums. Um, and it is available for download. And I highly recommend downloading it so at least you can get sort of an expanded uh, version of what I'm talking about here. The next thing I'd like to say is that uh, that this is I'm a di I work in digitization. I am not a lawyer. Um, this session is intended to be academic in nature and not provide legal advice. Um, much of this is from my experience and from what I've dealt with uh, through my years of doing this. Uh, we'll start out with. The basics, um, and actually this is copyright basics, very oversimplified. And uh, and it, it, again, anything in, in legalese is going to be very complicated. Uh, what I pulled out are probably three significant periods that we can talk about here. And that is uh, to start with that anything published before 1926 as of 2021 uh, is entering is ha is or entering the public domain. Uh, so works in 1925 will enter the public domain next year. Um, the other important part is uh, when published from t t 1926 to 1963, when published with a copyright notice, uh, the copyright exists for eight, for 28 years and they had to renew it and it could be renewed for another 47 years uh, and an additional 20 years. And if it wasn't renewed, that meant that the copyright moved into the public domain. And that's very important. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, about that need for uh, having to renew a copyright that it just isn't automatically uh, given to you. Um, and then another important date is uh, created uh, created before, if it was created before 1978, but not published. Uh, this is another important thing is that actually copyright law uh, protects and in some ways gives more protections to unpublished works. Uh, so it, not just published works, but works that are unpublished as well. So with unpublished works, it is the life of the author plus 70 years. So when the author passes away, the works are, pr are protected for another 70 years. So that means that unpublished works whose authors died in 1950 will enter the public domain next year. So if they died in 1951, uh, that means they're still protected. Uh, and that uh, deals a lot of with the things with small museums deal with, which are scrapbooks, diaries, personal papers, personal photos. Uh, none of these have been usually have not been published, and so they are they are protected by unpublished uh, work copyright laws. Um, so the so what we're gonna so the other thing I want to talk about is so there's co this copy the copyright law, but there's also libraries and archive have exemptions in the Copyright Act. There's two different sections in the Copyright Act. One is Section 107, which deals with fair use, and we'll talk about that. But then Section 108, uh, and the important thing to understand and is that museums are not mentioned in this wording. Uh, so if you're a museum that does not run a library or an archive, many historical sites do run at least an archive, so there's some protection there. Um, but the uh, but if you're just a museum, that this would not apply. Um, but I won't go too much in the detail of this, I'll just kind of run through it, but I, I, I draw your notice to the little gray box, section 108, uh, and uh, the, spinning, the spinning wheel. It's an interactive on this. Uh, which goes into more detail and is quite entertaining. And I highly recommend uh, uh, going to that link and, and checking it out. Um, but one of the things that allows this, this uh, exemptions in the Copyright Act allow archives and, and libraries to uh, 
uh, to do preservation copying of unpublished works. Um, it allows them to do uh, replacement copying of published works, uh, reproduction services for patrons, interlibrary loans, um, acquisition and reproduction of TV news programs, uh, which is uh, uh, fairly important because, I mean, it doesn't allow you to do things like music, but it does allow you to do news programs. So not entertainment programs, but news was recognized as something that had historical value. And so it allows for the reproduction of these programs. Um, it allows for reproduction equipment in libraries um, and to digitize during the last 20 years of a copyright term. Um, so some of these things can have a very big impact in what your projects are. Uh, obviously for publishing, for preservation copying of unpublished works. So if you're scanning photographs, documents, uh, you can certainly do that. Uh, if you're looking at replacement copying of published works, and we'll go into more detail of that, like say something like newspapers, it allows you to do that too. However, the next slide uh, talks about the restrictions, which are simple, but they're significant. Um, there could be no subs there can be no subsequent distribution of the digital format and the digital copy cannot be used outside the premise of the library archive so if you scan all those newspapers you can't actually put them online or you can't uh, even if an, another organization has the same newspapers and they paid for them you can't give them those digital copies they have to digitize their own all right so there's uh, very severe restrictions on what you can do with copyrighted materials that are still under copyright. So that, so that does limit that. So this is going to talk a little bit about more about the philosophy of this and copyright and theory exist to benefit the public good. Um, and and which is, you know, again, the idea is that it benefits the producer, but they can, they can reap the benefits of it, but it also uh, benefits the public that this, this will eventually go into the public domain and that people can utilize this in other ways. Um, and starting in 1790 uh, is when the first copyright came into the United States. And it's important to point out here, the United States was a, was a primarily agrarian society. So copyright law wasn't as nearly as important uh, in Britain, it was because they were producing works. Uh, they were, uh, and as as patent uh, patent law was also important. Uh, the United States was probably benefiting from uh, copyright violation and patent violations from the of Britain's uh, copyrights and patents. But as the United States started to create more uh, uh, copyrightable uh, things, uh, written. Uh, writings and things, uh, you start seeing a increased uh, uh, legislation increasing uh, the copyright span of the ter the duration of, of the terms of years and and really up until the tipping point in the uh, mid 1970s where it really starts to uh, where it really starts to kind of change um, from uh, that sort of on one end where maybe it was a little too loose to becoming more restrictive. And it's important to look at the, the if you look at the screen and the two written things there, fewer than 11% of the copyrights registered between 1883 and 1964 were renewed at the end of their 28 year term. Um, and then only a tiny fraction of books ever published are still in print. For example, of the 10,027 books published in the United States in 1930, only 174 are still in print in, in 2001. That's 1.7%. So much of the works that are simply copyrighted, there's only a few that maintain their val a, a monetary value, I should say, because as we know, what makes money is not necessarily historical, and what is historical does not necessarily make money. Um, and what has happened with the extension of the Copyright Act in 1976 and then the Sonny Bono Act in 1989, um, it's extended the copyright so that a few special interests can make money on a few copyrighted items. And it's suppressed and put at risk hundreds of thousands of historical documents, photographs, and recordings. Um, uh, because these are now considered orphaned works. And we'll, we'll get into that and talk a little bit about that uh, more in the next slide. And you have to understand our archives, museums, and libraries supposed to sit on these copyright items and store them at great cost until they're out of copyright, okay? So 
one of the things when we talk about orphaned works, what is what this what the what is what the extension of the Copyright Act has done is that, uh, and, and along with a couple of other things, with the elimination of renewing copyright and then also not having to register copyrights, that is putting a copyright notice on your work, um, it has put out a lot of work which nobody has any idea whether of what the copyright status is and or how to utilize this. Um, so an example of an orphaned work would be, is it anonymous? Is the company defunct? A lot of newspaper publishers are out of business. Uh, who, who owns the material? Is it go down the family or to another company? Is it, impo is it impossible to trace uh, a copyright through a multiple bequest and transition? So as uh, a person who's created this may go down you know, fa the family line and how do you find that? Um, or just simply the owner of the copyright or, their cop or the owner's representative cannot be located. Um, the Copyright Office has recommended um, these solutions, which uh, users uh, be expected to conduct a reasonably diligent uh, investigation to locate the copyright owner before they can exploit it, an orphaned work. So they're saying, okay, you can exploit this orphaned work, but you've got to do some diligent investigating to find it. Um, I think there's a uh, there's a question of what is diligent investigating. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. If the but if that is done, if the copyright owner later surfaces. The user would only have to pay reasonable compensation for the use of the work and not high penalties. So copyright violations, we could run into a hundred thousand um, dollars. It can that can be associated with copyright of infringements. And additionally, museums, archives, or excuse me, muse, <laughs> libraries, archives, and museums, and non-commercial users can even avoid those fees if they stop using them immediately. If they stop using the copyrighted material. Uh, very quickly. Um, and this is just, this is not, oops, excuse me. Okay. Um, so strategies for locating copyright owners. Um, and this is more kind of a practical, uh, and some of this is if you're dealing with uh, published works as opposed to unpublished works. So you examine the scholarship, you can look at citations, you can ask the publisher, if there's a publisher or literary talent agent, um, membership in organizations, uh, you know, so these are things that you can use. Obviously, what a lot of museums deal with are unpublished works. They deal with uh, uh, family photographs, they deal with diaries. Uh, so there may be things that, are much more difficult where you, you know the so you would have to kind of look at where the content creator's last known address is you may have to do some genealogical uh, investigation uh, so so there are strategies that you need to look at for locating these owners and if you can't find them then you've done your due diligence you should record this you should record this down in case if there is somebody who makes a claim in, in the future but it's important for this. It's important to think of your mission. Cultural institutions have long occupied a special place in copyright law. So due to their missions of preserving and facilitating access to intellectual and creative works. Um, so it would be unfortunate if in their desire to avoid all risks, these same institutions failed in their fundamental mission. So again, you have a, what is the mission it is not just to preserve, but to, to promote and to, and to show that history. It's not just sitting, having it in your archives, uh, but it's about education. It's about access. Um, so that is part of the fundamental issue of being an archive, being a library, and being a museum. Um, so that is important to think about when you do this. And so one of the things as an organization, historical organization, is to think about a risk management strategy. So it isn't just a simple on and off. If it's copyrighted, we can't use it unless we have permission. You have to really think about how to do a risk management strategy um, and strategies that can mitigate some of those risks. So, so again, reasons for the risk might be include the copyright of the status is unclear. Um, it may not be possible to, identi to identify 
um, all of the copyrights in one work. And so one of the one of the uh, things that can happen is like a newspaper, you have ads, you have syndicated content. Uh, sometimes with a paper, you may have copyright someone who is the author of the book, and then there is the publisher of the book, and they can hold two separate copyrights. Um, it may not be possible to locate copyright owners and secure permission, which is probably one of the probably one of the one that happens the most. Uh, works in a public domain in the United States may be protected in other countries. So other countries have different laws. One of those are uh, historical paintings. Um, the United States doesn't recognize the copyright on paintings uh, uh, that have any type of heritage value. Um, and in other countries like England, uh, those are considered uh, in, under copyright uh, by the institution or, or organization. Uh, Individuals and groups may believe they have more rights than the law allows and take umbrage when an institution digitizes the material. So even if the even if you know that something is out of copyright, you still may get people who insist that this is copyrighted or that they, they own it. And ironically, it's actually, I find that museums are the ones that are most in violation of this. Um, most museums have photos that exist before 1925, and yet many of them will insist that they have copyright to them. And they don't. You own the, you own the photograph, but you don't have copyright over it. So, um, and that's where I see that happening. But it does happen with uh, other people. Families may say that this photo belongs to them when it is obviously been out of copyright. Um, so, so one of the things is, is really you have to assess uh, mitigating risks and determine you know, whether or not what's the comfortable level of risk before you engage in any project before proceeding. So how an institution assesses risk can vary um, depending on the project under consideration. And these are really important things. Um, the nature of material being digitized, is it, uh, um, is it something that is a highly recognizable, uh, like a, from a professional, uh, a professional photographer versus a snapshot, uh, the accessibility of the digital content um, is this getting being viewed at the at just the museum in a kiosk, or is it being put online, or is it being even distributed even farther? Is it being put on uh, t-shirts? Uh, the likely remedies in case of legal proceedings. So what happens? Is it you know is it something that you feel confident enough that you could if somebody comes and you know, makes a legal claim. Uh, <laughs> this is an odd one and one that affects virtually nobody, uh, I imagine, uh, with the exception of maybe the Minnesota Historical Society, the availability of sovereign immunity arguments. So very few organizations can claim that, state archive being one. Um, so uh, a state can basically claim sovereign immunity and and say that it is immunity from, from copyright violation. Um, so the inarguable existence of an implied license uh, is, you know, is there some type of licensing beyond a copyright that is, has been made? The likelihood of a complaint being made, is there, a you know, will, will, there, will there be a complaint being made on, on what you're digitizing and making available in an exhibit, online, outside? Um, and, the, and this is also, this is an important thing, and it's not necessarily about copyright, but the potential impact on the institution's reputation or uh, relationship with current and future donors. So if you're dealing with uh, digitizing and putting, and, I've, and I have seen this with smaller organizations, they're digitizing and putting things online um, and they have clear copyright, but it also um, has not sat well with the community. And so that's one of the things you have to kind of look at and it can affect your donors and the reputation with your community as well. Um, another is the institution's level of comfort with risk. Uh, museums are notoriously risk averse. Um, and, uh, and you have to kind of decide, is this something that's going to be risk is risky, um, available le legal advice. And if you're lucky enough to have a lawyer on your board or people who have uh, legal knowledge, it's very helpful. 
And the proceed, and it's probably one of the most important things too, is, is the perceived social utility of proceeding with the project. Is this something daylighting history that is lost or underrepresented? Uh, um, you know, or is it just simply you're putting an image on a coffee cup, you're digitizing to sell it on a coffee cup or a t-shirt. Um, but if this is something that is really presenting something that has been ignored or has been under uh, presented, this may be something you wish to put push through in the community. Um, we're kind of a, a, this is sort of a rehash on it, but as we look at um, the photos and we talk about things that are risky and not risky, I mean, there, there's, this, is, this is a really good, interesting thing because you see this is, of course, Bob Dylan. And if this was a, by a professional photographer and you had it in your collection, <clears throat> uh, you, have, you, know, you have an issue of, of you know, how much is this going to be defended under copyright. Next to it, you have a snapshot which almost every museum has hundreds or thousands of these. And, and, you know, is the photographer in that going to be, you know, if this was something that was donated to your historical society, but no form was given uh, for copyright transfer, um, you know, is this going to be something you can use in an exhibit? It's, it's probably going to be safe bet that that's going to be okay, whereas the Bob Dylan one might be more of a challenge. The grand irony in this is actually the Bob Dylan image on the right is actually uh, more publicly accessible because it's licensed through Wikimedia Commons, which is a whole nother webinar session I could get into. And the image on the right, that is actually my family from 1950, the 1950s, I should say. Um, it was taken by my dad. My dad is still alive at 86 years old. That means it's unpublished um, and that he, uh, and that's so that it, at the time of his death, copyright will be protected for 70 years. So the irony is the image on, this, on the right is actually has more copyright protection than the image on the left. But I would argue that the image on the left is pro or image on the right of the family is going to be less risky to use in an exhibit than the image on the right um, if you didn't know what the copyright was, all right? Um, so these are things as far as risk analysis that you really got to kind of look at and you got to go through. So when we talk about litigation against cultural institutions, it's good to understand that it's actually historically been very low. And the reason really has to go with the cost of litigation can be high. Um, and a lot of what cultural institutions do tend to put out is uh, when we talk, like I said before, um, that what is historical is not necessarily make money. Um, a lot of what they put out is going to be more about like the family photograph on the side, which is not a, a big monetary driver that, uh, that, that corporations will want to make money on. Um, so, but with, and the other thing, there are uh, uh, codes in the law that do protect uh, organizations. Uh, Section 504 uh, stipulates that nonprofit education, nonprofit educational institutions, library and archives, are not subject to, to uh, statutory damages for copyright infringement when they have reasonable ground for behavior, when they believe that the, their use was in fair use. So that if you can present the argument that, that, uh, that what you put up was for fair use, for educational things, you're actually protected. It won't protect you from monetary damages. So if you made money on it, you might have to pay a percentage of it, but they can't go and charge $10,000 for just using the image. Um, so there is protection on that. Um, the, so that's, so, so that's a, so, so, so these are probably really good arguments to look at. And I want to bring up uh, the next part is we, we, so we talked about copyright. I also want to talk a little bit about fair use and, and you'll see on the right, the image of the mouse, uh, Mickey mouse. And if anybody knows Disney, they know that they like to protect their copyrights very stringently. Um, and you've probably heard of the stories of them suing uh, schools and daycare centers for, for murals, painting murals on their work. Um, and, and those are true. <laughs> um, and, and I agree with them. Actually, they, they do need, if they don't protect their copyright or their trademark, 
they will lose it. So, so it isn't necessarily that they're the big bad company, but they do have to protect it. And if they don't protect it, they do lose it. And in the case of murals, um, if the person painting it was making money, uh, then that is a commercial venture. And then the, the mural itself has no edge. It's not an educational, it's an entertainment value. Um, in the case here where I'm using the mouse, um, it is used in a way that is, the idea of it, it is used in an educational way. Um, but there are other ways when in, with fair use in section 107, um, it talks about four factors and, and it obviously is the purpose and character of the use. This is not for entertainment. This is for educational, uh, the nature of the copyrighted work, um, and the amount and substantiability of the portion used. So one of the things that you'll see here is that it's a low res image, it's small. Um, it is, it's only one shot. Uh, so it's, it's not like I'm showing the whole video of the Mickey Mouse Club. And, and then also the potential market or the value of the copyrighted work. Well, um, the, when you download the uh, the PDFs, if you download the PDFs, you're not paying a charge. This is being shared freely with you. Um, so in a sense, the judgment on this is this is fair use. Um, and uh, and by the way, the image came from Wikipedia. <laughs> um, and they also determined that this was also fair use that they put on their website. Uh, so you can use copyrighted images in fair use, but you have to be very careful about that. Um, and even if you're... And, and particularly for museums, it's going to be less of an issue because of that educational component. Um, if you start using it, you start using them on, like I say, t-shirts and coffee mugs, then you got a whole nother criteria and you've got to be very careful. Um, or if you're misrepresenting, you're using something and you're, you're uh, um, you know, and I guess that gets more in the term of libel. Um, so I want to get on to the, this next section. So we're kind of talking a little bit, one of the big things that I get a lot, this, this presentation is being presented um, as part of the, uh, the grants office program, because we talk about grants, and I want to talk about one of the, the most challenging things I get, and I often get this, and I want to go very specifically with this, because everybody wants to digitize their newspapers, all right? And there probably isn't a more difficult thing to, to digitize, um, as far as what I've seen. Um, newspapers are a copy are a copyright quagmire. Meyer. Um, so, for newspapers before 1963, did they renew their copyright? Well, if if it didn't renew their copyright, then that newspaper publisher is is it is free. But you have to show that. Um, so you need to go to the copyright office and you need to hire them to do the research. And as of October 2019, the fees amount to $200 per hour with a $200 minimum. Now, it's important to understand the other part of this is that research on the copyright to see if it's been renewed has to be done on each issue, on each newspaper, not on the year. So you can't, so it's, if it's a daily newspaper, it has to be done each day. If it's a monthly or weekly, it has to be done each month. So you can't just go by a year and say, is this copyrighted? The other issue is a newspaper can be amalgamation of content. So in addition to a newspaper creating its own content and copyright, you may have syndicated content, such as a comic strip or a columnist. Um, you also have ads, ads that are created by companies and the illustrations in the newspapers. They have their own copyrights. Okay, so, and, you know, and then on top of it, there are also uh, uh, um uh, sometimes a newspaper may use uh, uh, outsource and not use their own uh, um, reporters. And if they didn't file the paperwork well enough, the reporter may actually own the story content. So it becomes really a real mess. Um, and one of the things I like to say is that it's easy to digitize. That's the easiest part. The hardest part is dealing with the copyright. Um, it's also hard to organize digital content and, and newspapers are especially difficult because they create so many pages. Um, so it's important in our grants program, the Minnesota Historical and Cultural Heritage Grants, while the Minnesota Historical and Cultural Heritage Grants does fund digitization projects, funds cannot be used for the digitization of newspapers. 
Um, the Minnesota Historical Society, Minnesota, Minnesota Historical and Cultural Heritage Fund grants can be used to microfilm newspapers, however. Um, that has been one of those things where, see, the issue with digital is that it's still, it's, there's still a lot of fighting around what can be done and not done. Most publishers at this point are comfortable with the idea of microfilm um, because microfilm does not leave the museum. It does not leave the library. Whereas most people who digitize want to put things up online. And particularly with newspapers nowadays, because they are dealing with a funding crisis as, as economics change, they're looking at whatever funds they can get. So they really do not want to see things online. Even if they're not making money at it, they're really not comfortable with having their, thing, having their papers put online. So it is a struggle there. Um, um, all that being said, the Minnesota Historical Society also does have a program to digitize newspapers. So the Minnesota Historical Society is digitizing newspapers that have entered into the public domain, and that is uh, uh, before 1925 or 1926. So kind of segueing now, I'm going to go to the part two, um, leaving the digitization of uh, talking about digitization copyright, and to talk a little bit about the grants program for those of you who are interested uh, in, in Minnesota. Um, so the Minnesota Historical Society and Cultural Heritage Grants has a category for conversion and digital reproduction. Because um, we know a lot of historical organizations have uh, you know historical resources in forms. Some of them are deteriorating. Some of them they need public access. Uh, the digitization program is there to help with that. Uh, the 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 key with understanding the the digital conversion and reproduction is uh, is that there are standards that need to be followed. Obviously, a uh, like a, uh, you know how 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 what is the uh the the size of the scan is it going to be how many dots per inch um are you you know if you're dealing with negatives and you're dealing with uh documents there's going to be different types of formats that have to be how are you going to deal with uh, uh backing up and long-term preservation because digital assets ironically well, can be simple. They can be they they can be very ephemeral. It can be very easy to delete. So you want to make sure that you have it properly backed up and stored. That in case if there's a a failure of a hard drive or a loss of a computer, that you're not going to be losing all of that work that you did. Um, so the other thing is, if you are looking for a grant, um, on the very bottom it talks about who is eligible, and it's important to note that the Minnesota Historical and, Cu Historical and Cultural Heritage Grants Program is uh, for not for individuals, but for rather for organizations and five hundred one c three nonprofits, units of government, tribal organizations, and educational institutions. Um, if if the organization is not a five hundred one c three, then it'll have to uh, have to be. Um, work with another interested applicant on this on whatever project and the and we don't do uh, the the program does not do equipment grants it, it funds projects so you have to have some type of project in mind um, and but it's also important to know is as we the great thing about this program is that the grants office here is that we can help uh, we offer open houses. The next open house is coming up in January uh, 2021. Uh, I would email uh, uh, Dillian McGuire uh, at mnhs.org to get uh, the information. Um, we have what, what you're seeing here, webinars. You can email us with questions. So if you have digital, if you have, if you have, you're working on a project and you have questions on digital on digitizing your collections. I want to hear about it. I would love to talk to you before you submit an application. Uh, this is very unlike a lot of uh, um, foundational grants and other types of grants. Uh, this program, there's a lot of help here. Uh, you can call, well, I say this is, you can call us. That's a little more difficult now because uh, we are all working from home because of COVID-19. But normally you could call us. Uh, but we still can. We can still certainly outreach with on with online meetings and such. Um, again, a request an in-person meeting. Um, 
when COVID uh, releases its grip on the population, by God, we'll be out there doing in-person meeting and on-site meetings again. Uh, but however, uh, we would be happy to do uh, uh, meetings like this with Google Meet or Zoom to uh, talk with you or your board about what your projects are. Uh, and that is, again, a, a real big benefit that we have with this program. Um, things you should know about upcoming deadlines. So if you're looking at applying for a grant, uh, January 8th is the next round, and then April 9th, July 9th, and they're offered small grants, which are $10,000 and under, are offered four times a year. And, uh, and then we have one large grant a year, and that's for $10,000, $10,001 and on up. And there's a mandatory pre-application on July 23rd. And, and uh, this is all pending funding, anything after July, because that is, uh, we have to get appropriated money from the state again. Um, and, the, and, it's, and the mandatory pre-application, and the reason why it is, is that it allows us to look at the application and to help you out even more and, and to say, how can we make this, this application stronger? Are you missing something? So we're here to help you with that. Um, the final application is September uh, 10th, and then the HRAC committee, and these is a group, a group of individuals uh, from around the state of Minnesota uh, that will that will be that will be looking at and deciding on on the on the grants to be funded. They'll be meeting in the fall of 2001 or 2021. So, if you have any questions. Uh, I would probably highly recommend uh, emailing before calling, but you can, but, but uh, grants at mnhs.org. Uh, if you want to start sending in, if you want to start asking general grant questions, um, the grant access to the grants portal is at the web address there. Um, your organization, if you haven't already, you can apply for an account. Uh, again, has to meet one of the criteria. Um, and also, you want to see the, the the Minnesota Historical and Cultural Heritage Grants website, and you want to visit the manual, there's the website for that as well. Um, and so with that, I thank you, and I appreciate your time. And, uh, and feel free, if you have any questions, if you have a project, my email address is down there in the corner, joe.hoover at mnhs.org. And I thank you for attending and being part of this. Thank you. And so if, if any of you uh, have questions, feel free to either uh, unmute yourself and shout it out, or you can put it into the chat um, up there in the upper right. And um, so this is John Fulton from the grants office. One thing I wanted to throw in there is that um, besides the the small grant deadline and the large grant deadline that, that Joe pointed out, we do have the Heritage Partnership Program, which has a deadline in January. So it's gonna be January 22nd when it, and that's a, that's a pre-application too that comes in. And, um, And that would be, uh, you know, a partnership program. You know, you wouldn't normally do digitization work with that kind of uh, grant, but um, but if two or more organizations wanted to get together and figure out what you know what and they were going to digitize it, how they were going to digitize it, and possibly if they wanted to, they could uh, get funds to research copyright on their on um, the collections they're looking at. So I just wanted to uh, point that out. So we have a question from Crystal Boyd from the Golden Valley Historical Society on, uh, could you offer any advice about researching copyright for groups that are no longer in existence? For example, what would you think about scanning yearbooks for Golden Valley High School, which is no longer in operation? Again, that's a great example of an orphan copyright and one that uh, is very problematic. Um, it, the, it would be interesting to know who 
holds the copyright sometimes in the it depends <laughs> um so it, uh, depending on the content that's been put in there uh the uh, um, like some ads are actually copyrighted by the by the, if you have businesses that are putting in they would be copyrighted by the businesses but for the most part it would be simply by the school and by the school district so what I would prob what I would probably say is that where so when the Golden Valley High School closed where did the school district merge into and it would probably go to that school district. And, uh, and again, that's what I would consider something that would probably be fairly low risk in, in digitizing. But if you wanted to look at the copyright, I would probably say the next uh, would probably going into this, the school district um, to, to see. Uh, another question, do we need a release for using photos from volunteers on a project? Um, so if you're using photos I'm assuming if you're talking about uh, uh, photos that, uh, like if it, if people if volunteers are taking photos rather than volunteers being the subject of the photos, um, so if they're taking the photos, yes, you would need to have them uh, provide you with, in general, a, a form turning over the copyright if if you wanted to have the copyright. Owning a photo is different than owning the copyright, like owning artwork is different than owning the copyright on that artwork. So it allows you to own the artwork, but you don't get to make copies and sell them. Um, so if you're talking about a release for uh, for somebody in the photo, then that's a whole different thing. You, you would need to get a release from any subjects if, if, uh, if you were taking very no recognizable photos of them. Um, does social media constitute fair use if it is educational uh, and not making the organization any money? Hmm. Um, well, <laughs> I would say most social media does not make the organization much money. Um, and it depends. Um, it, a lot of... <sighs> A lot of what I see in social media oftentimes is it's more people posting photos and saying, isn't this interesting? Um, like, here's a day in history, which isn't bad, but there isn't any interpretation behind the photo. There isn't anything like any type of... And, and when I think if you were to write something about the photo and talk more about it, I think that would buffer you even more. If you're just posting photo, then that does become entertainment. If you're just like, if you're just, here's a photo for today, here's an, an object for today, but you don't write anything about it, then what's the educational value of that? So it's more of a nostalgic value. Um, that is how we ca caption our posts. What is stereograph is? Could you expand on that, I guess, Stephanie? Does that mean as far as uh, as when you do a post, you put more, you put more information behind it? Okay, all right. That's what. Okay, good. That's what I was thinking. So yes, I, I I think, I think when you do that, when you put something, when you're writing about it, um, it it does become then it becomes more educational. If you're just posting it, and I see a lot of organizations putting up photos with almost no information on it, um, then it just becomes entertainment. And so it, it uh, so you have to be very careful. And entertainment then doesn't count as fair use then. Uh, I mean, it's, I would say it's, it's, it's weak. It's a weaker position. I wouldn't say that it wouldn't constitute as fair use. You are a historical society. You're posting photos of your community or of whatever you're representing. And it's, um, and and if, and so I can see that being it, but if you're grabbing photos um, from something else, from some other community or something, like, and I, I, I do see this occasionally where here's a, I, I'm going to, well, say, uh, 
Here's a photo. Here's a nostalgic photo of a of a board game from the 1960s. Isn't this cute? Isn't this? Oh, don't you remember this? This has nothing to do with your community. It's nostalgic, and it's um, and again, it's probably low risk that you would be sued for doing it for posting it. But it is, in a sense, a, a pretty big. It's a copyright violation that is um, that I would say would be very weak with uh, uh, fair use. What if you are soliciting donations on your Facebook page or that count as profiting? Um, yes and no. If you're using the image as a way to profit, um, if uh, it's just soliciting, it, using, using social media as like just using your facility for raising donations because you have donation signs at your facility that's not and, and if the content is definitely separated um it would not count as as profiting um from the, what you're profiting from what you're more worried about is profiting directly from the use of that so like with, that's why i say like if you're using it it's probably easiest to say as in an image like a coffee mug or a or a t-shirt uh that would be more directly um, tied to a direct profiting. Um, whereas if you're, you're putting out uh, the give men, uh, uh, you know, give men and you're, and you're putting out stuff for, for donating on give men day. And, uh, and that would be a different, uh, that would be different than if you're putting up a series of photographs on, on schools in your community and talking about how the schools, but that's completely separate from your from your what you're doing to raise money. Now, if you're saying uh, give money, we'll give you a print of this school. Now, then you are directly profiting. Any other questions? Well, all right. Well, I thank you all of you for being part of this and joining in. And uh, and again, if you have any other questions, feel free to contact us. That's what we're here for. And uh, thank you very much, John. I'll I'll turn it over to you if you want to close it out or or what you'd like to do. No, I. Uh, just uh, thanks everyone, and uh, I this should be posted within two weeks. Um, uh, where it'll be posted is a, is a different question, but if you, uh, I'm sure if you ask Joe where it is, he will know in, in a couple weeks if you want to see the actual recording. And that's all I got. Well, thank you very much, and have a have a good and pleasant holiday. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm.